Annenberg Media. I met myself this morning coming in, and all day I have been a black bell ringing. I survive, survive, survive. Recently, I dreamt I was at a seance. A woman's face appeared before me, asking me to name the person I loved most on earth. Behind her was an Aztec pillar. All I can remember of the next scene is two gigantic escalators crisscrossing over rushing water. As I descended one, a man pursued me on the other. Well, at the time, I understood it all. Now I can only remember a sequence of images the woman's face, the Aztec column, my pursuer. Dreams, as expressions of our unconscious mind, consist mostly of images. Poems, too, exist primarily as a series of sensory impressions. Remember the Red Wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams? So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. It's the images we focus on, the red wheelbarrow, the white chickens. William's subject is the wonder we all feel when we truly pay attention to even ordinary things like wheelbarrows or chickens. Images are, in fact, our first contact with reality. Something from the outside world registers on our consciousness through one of the senses. This sensory impression may enter through the eye as color, through the ear as sound, or through the tongue as taste. And when we remember with any vividness, we remember in images. Our consciousness, like our dreams, is a kind of photomontage, a sequence of many simultaneous impressions, mostly visual. Poems are also images, images conveyed in words. Words and images are the stuff poetry is made of. Ezra Pounds, in a station of the Metro, contains only two images. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough. Pound offers us two levels of reality. The objective world of faces in a crowded subway and the subjective world which we grasp through a sudden, powerful, imaginative comparison. But not every poem achieves its effect through the shock of surprise. The image of the wheeling falcon which dominates Gerard Manley Hopkins' The Windover suggests the sheer force of creation. To Christ our Lord, I caught this morning, morning's minion, Kingdom of Daylight's Dauphin, dapple dawn-drawn falcon, in his riding of the rolling level underneath his steady air. And striding high there, how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy. Then off, off forth on swing, as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend. The hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achiever of the mastery of the thing. Brute beauty and valor and act, O oh, air, pride, plume, here, buckle, and the fire that breaks from thee then. A billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, 
Oh, my Chevalier. No wonder of it. Sheer plod makes plow down silly and shine. And blue bleak embers, ah, my dear, fall, gall themselves, and gash gold vermilion. Hopkins is actually contrasting the wild beauty of the bird in this life with the spiritual claims of the next. The profusion of sense detail lavished on the falcon sets us up for that contrast. But Lewis McNeese, in Snow, bombards us with sheer sensory experience in order to create a rich and varied material world. The room was suddenly rich and the great bay window was spawning snow and pink roses against it. Soundlessly collateral and incompatible. World is suddener than we fancy it. World is crazier and more of it than we think. Incorrigibly plural. I peel and portion a tangerine and spit the pips and feel the drunkenness of things being various. And the fire flames with a bubbling sound, for world is more spiteful and gay than one supposes. On the tongue, on the eyes, on the ears, in the palms of one's hands, there is more than glass between the snow and the huge roses. Images not only communicate the sensory world, they can also communicate ideas, abstract ideas. Living in a crowded modern city is lonely, alienating, squalid, depressing. These abstract ideas are never directly stated in T.S. Eliot's poem, Preludes. Instead, the images embody the ideas. The winter evening settles down with smell of stakes and passageways. Six o'clock. The burnt out ends of smoky days. And at the corner of the street, a lonely cab horse steams and stamps. And then the lighting of the lamps. The morning comes to consciousness of faint stale smells of beer from the sawdust trampled street with all its muddy feet that pressed to early coffee stands. With the other masquerades, the time resumes. One thinks of all the hands that are raising dingy shades in a thousand furnished rooms. I am moved by fancies that are curled around these images and cling. The notion of some infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering thing. Wipe your hands across your mouth and laugh. The worlds revolve like ancient women gathering fuel in vacant lots. The images in all these poems help create an alternative yet complete world. But unless the poet and the poem speak in a real voice and in a real body, we're not likely to be moved very deeply. Just as artists use clay to sculpt or watercolor to paint, so poets use words. Poets are making something out of words, not so much saying something as making something. Poets are in love with words. They care about the physicality of the words, the sound, the length, as well as the meaning. They write and rewrite 10, 20, 40 drafts for the poet knows that the right words in the right order can be a kind of magic. <laughs> Emily Dickinson, the 19th century American poet, uses ordinary words in her poetry, but her combinations of those words can be startling. The soul selects her own society. The soul selects her own society, then shuts the door to her divine majority, present no more. Unmoved, 
she notes the chariots pausing at her low gate. Unmoved, an emperor be kneeling upon her mat. I've known her from an ample nation, choose one. Then close the valves of her attention like stone. Sanchez uses even more informal language, including slang and street talk in her poetry. But like Dickinson, she selects the diction that fits her meaning. Right on, white America. This country might have been a pioneer land once, but there ain't no more Indians blowing Custer's mind with a different image of America. This country might have needed shootouts daily once, but there ain't no more real white, all-American bad guys. Just you and me, black and unarmed. This country might have been a pioneer land once, and it still is. Check out the falling gun shells on our black tomorrow. Ordinary words can have extraordinary effects. Emily Dickinson uses simple words in surprising contexts, while Sonia Sanchez mixes everyday speech and slang with a powerful effect. Professors Mary Poovey and Marjorie Perloff comment on the power of these word choices. How, for instance, does Dickinson achieve her imagery? Um, a heart can have valves. A machine can have valves. It's hard for me to understand the way in which a soul can have valves, or the way in which a stone can have valves. So for me, the struggle in this poem is to close the gap between the heart slash machine on the one hand and the soul slash stone on the other, and to understand the way in which that gap can only be closed by attributing an, inter an interpretive act to the I, which is looking at the soul. And what makes her imagery so special is that she'll always put, let's say, a, um, a metaphysical concept or a spiritual concept in a bodily concept where you would least expect it. So you don't think of the soul selecting her own society. You don't think of the soul behaving this way. In contrast, Sanchez's poem concentrates on the physical power of the images. The violence that Sanchez does to words, to individual words in this poem, describes or mimics or mirrors the kind of violence that she's describing in the poem. What's surprising to me about the poem is that I expected it to be a poem about white-black violence, but that it seems to be about black-on-black uh, -black violence. And her contraction of the word black to be LK epitomizes the way in which there's a kind of um, collapse in the black community. It's a kind of collapse in that word itself. Some people uh, think that unless a poem uses highly specialized and formal diction, it isn't a poem at all. Well, while this clearly isn't true, uh, still some of the most well-known and loved poetry in English language is highly formal and patterned. Poems like Shakespeare's Sonnet 29. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, Featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, haply I think on thee 
and then my state. Like to the lark at break of day, arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Well, not all love poetry is as formal and courtly as Shakespeare's. Marge Piercy uses everyday language and everyday word order in one of her love poems, Will We Work Together? You wake in the early gray morning in bed alone and curse me that I am only sometimes there. But when I am with you, I light up the corners. I am bright as a fireplace roaring with love. Every bone in my back and my fingers is singing like a tea kettle on the boil. My heart wags me, a big dog with a bigger tail. I am a new coin printed with your face. My body wears sore before I can express on yours the smallest part of what moves me. Words shred and splinter. I want to make with you some bold new thing to stand in the marketplace. Oh, the statue of a goddess laughing, armed and wearing flowers and feathers. Like sheep of whose hair is made blankets and coats, I want to force from this fierce, dirty, rampant love some useful thing. The themes of these love poems are similar. Love can be one's salvation. The most obvious structural device in this sonnet is the turn that occurs in the poem uh, from the narrator cursing despair in the octave to the optimism and contentedness that uh, shows up in the sestet. Um, the first part of the poem contains words like disgrace, trouble, curse. The second part, happily, the image of the lark, the break of day, the sweet love, wealth. So that we have a contrast in the attitude of the speaker from the first part of the sonnet to the second part of the sonnet. Else, and it's comical, really, in a way. But Piercy's imagery is quite different from Shakespeare's. Roaring with love. She gives strings of metaphors, which Shakespeare doesn't really do. Shakespeare's poem actually has very little metaphor. It's quite straightforward. I'm interested in the way in which the poem moves through a series of relatively domestic images in the center. The tea kettle on the boil, my heart wags me, a big dog with a bigger tail to images that increasingly become public images and begin to move toward display, monumental, coin, uh, building a, mar a, a statue in the marketplace, a statue of a goddess laughing, um, and then finally the image of the, the blanket being created out of the sheep's hair. So that the poem moves with a kind of accelerating um, energy toward a, a public display and, a, and toward a celebration of a love that originally seemed to be quite private and domestic. Now, some poets actually invent a language for their poem. That's what Lewis Carroll did with Jabberwocky. Twas brillig. And the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the mome wraths outgrabe. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub jub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time the mangsome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. 
And as in uffish thought he stood, the Jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, frabjous day, kaloo, kalay, he chortled in his joy. T'was brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the mome wraths outgrabe. Even with its invented language, Jabberwocky has a kind of formality. If it were a piece of music, it would be a classical Bach fugue. On the other hand, Lucille Clifton's This Morning for the girls of Eastern High School would be a piece of improvisational jazz. This morning, this morning, I met myself coming in. A bright jungle girl, shining, quick as a snake, a tall tree girl, a me girl. I met myself this morning coming in, and all day I've been a black bell ringing. I survive, survive, survive. Poets construct their poems out of words, new, old, strange, or ordinary. Words can be a magical incantation, and poets, like Lucille Clifton, are the first to acknowledge this. This morning, this morning I met myself coming in, a bright jungle girl shining quick as a snake, a tall tree girl, a me girl, I met myself this morning coming in, and all day I have been a black bell ringing. I survive, survive, survive. I worked for a while in a program in Baltimore City Schools, and I remember going to Eastern High School one morning and looking around, and I think there have been a lot of questions in the media and a lot of places about survival for black people. And I looked around and I saw all these girls who were so bright and alive and human and who were me, you know. And I thought, well, of course we survive. It was such a celebratory thing to me. I felt so alive and so, so affirmed by their presence. Lucille Clifton's poems have been called a celebration of being a woman and being an African American. She grew up in a working-class family in Buffalo, New York, attended Howard University for two years, married, and had six children. She has been a poet in residence at various colleges, including Coppin State College, St. Mary's College in Southern Maryland, and the University of California. And as always, she has written poems. Poetry for me was not a matter of choosing to be a poet. I don't understand that kind of choosing. I've been very interested in words and language, and, and I've been writing poetry since I was a little girl. Clifton has often written about her role as a poet. I beg my bones to be good, but they keep clicking music. And I spin in the center of myself a foolish, frightful woman moving my skin against the wind and tap dancing for my life. I could have said dancing for my life because the idea of music as, uh, of poetry rather as music and as a kind of dance of language is, is not uncommon. And tap dancing because that's also a click of a sound, you see. I think I'm aware of the fact that words are their resonance, their, their definition, their history, the sound of them together. To Clifton's ears, the sounds of ordinary speech contain the rhythms of poetry. 
I think that the American language is an extremely musical language, and I do write in the American spoken tongue. I think the whole language is available for poetry. And depending on, on content, sometimes colloquial language is the, is the appropriate language given what I'm talking about. Clifton calls herself an urban poet, and her images reflect the city and its people. I like to use imagery that comes from my entire history, and my history has been a black woman on this continent. Uh, and I also am interested in reaffirming, redefining uh, words that have sometimes been given negative connotations. These hips are big hips. They need space to move around in. They don't fit into little petty places. These hips are free hips. They don't like to be held back. These hips have never been enslaved. They go where they want to go and they do what they want to do. These hips are mighty hips. These hips are magic hips. I have known them to put a spell on a man and to spin him like a top. And hips are, are such a, such an unspoken um, valued thing in this country. And I like to, I sometimes wish to give voice for those who do not speak, for things that are not spoken of, and uh, to do it in an exuberant way, in a joyful way. Working with images is not just a preference of the mind, it is an absolute inalterable fact for all of us, poets and readers alike. We all dream, wish, fear, remember, and think in images. And those images are clothed in words. Poems, then.